Hi, my name is Bob Grinier and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. So I shared this uh, document uh, on October the 26th, 2019. I was given a tip off uh, by someone and uh, I uh, have looked at uh, its uh, uh, presentation here and uh, it's saying the engineering physics of an optimized confinement concept the plasmic configuration we began inventing a potentially best workable concept for fusion in 1973 now if you look at it uh, this is US patent number 4023065 and if you look at that uh, you will see it here and you will see quite helpfully that it has expired uh, a long time ago. So you are free to use the concepts within this document. And uh, if we actually go to the patent itself, you will see something uh, which is very interesting. Uh, firstly, there is a high voltage source. So here's the, your gaseous environment and here's your electrodes. And so you are polarizing whatever it is in here. And then you are using a source of ionizing energy in here. And then there may be or may not be a discharge between these two points. And it describes in the paper um, how uh, these uh, filaments form and then they bind up. And then it goes on to show how they come together and they join in and their field lines join together and they form a toroid and this toroid is going around like this and this is a toroidal uh, uh, motion uh, the flux and this is a poloidal motion here so you've got counter rotating vortices on the halves but it's going round so effectively it's going it's going round and like this and so on and this is basically the structure that I came up with uh, in the beginning of 2018 um, uh, based on what I was looking at in the uh, witness uh, of uh, materials of, of a large number of experiments like ECHO and uh, NOVA and uh, 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 LION and so forth. And uh, I concluded that yeah, this actually must be <laughs> uh, something that's uh, very, very important to this process. So you can see here uh, you've got your uh, field lines going around like this and your procession like that. So um, this is poloidal and this is uh, toroidal. And actually, I'll share a, a link to a document um, uh, online where it shows that uh, you have to have um, toroidal and poloidal uh, motion uh, uh, flux in, in order to stabilize mag magnetic fields and stabilize a, a plasmoid. And so... Um, uh, that's interesting in its own right, and that's with respect to uh, stars and so forth. So this is generating these toroids, uh, and uh, they are saying that these toroids then form a sheath, uh, which is ionized, and uh, and uh, you get these uh, flux uh, and material uh, going around and so forth. And they're saying this is our apparatus, and then there's another version of the apparatus here, and, and uh, it describes how... This is our atmosphere in here. This is the uh, what they uh, lovingly call here the plasmac, uh, and it's in in this position here. And then what they have around these areas here are these little uh, um, pressure control diaphragms, uh, and they just keep this located in the centre by physically squirting a little bit of gas in here. So effectively, what you're doing is you're creating a ball lightning. Uh, in here and then you are just squirting a bit of uh, air uh, just to reposition it to keep it away from the uh, perimeter of uh, the device. So there, there we go and uh, this is with re respect to uh, generating energy. I just want to um, uh, go and look at the paper that was uh, uh, released here in uh, I think it was uh, 2003 I think it was 2002 I'm just going to draw your attention to a couple of slides uh, I will give a link to where this is I would suggest you download it because it's on the Wayback Machine and, and someone might find a way to uh, scrape that from the internet so I'll get it whilst it's there but anyway, so for example, we successfully produced plasmax of one centimeter diameter with a 20 joule input from a pre-ionizer pulse. Now, I will 
um, go into the importance of the pre-ionization here uh, with respect to the work of Shishkin, which uh, I, I, I want to come on to. But uh, explaining that it, it, it's not just a case of ionizing to plasma, there's, there's something else more interesting going on. Uh, but anyway, so what you can imagine is going on here is that, that this source of ionizing energy is pre-ionizing the gases in here before you have your discharge. And effectively, this is the PAP setup where you have a... Um, uh, a radioactive source that pre-ionizes the gas before you have the discharge. And so this is effectively a PAP reactor. And uh, um, uh, this is actually similar concepts are discussed in here, but not with re reference as far as I know to this document. Um, but uh, this is a, a common thing, this, this uh, uh, ionization. So um, you will find this in a number of uh, different um, uh, so-called uh, over-unity devices. Uh, another one might be the uh, what they call the Swiss stone that was in the Hen Henry Murray device. And again, that is discussed in here. And effectively, that's doing the pre-ionization of the gap. And then he had uh, high voltage uh, in his um, uh, valves. And so you can imagine that whatever it's doing, it's creating the same kind of uh, uh, structures, uh, which one might refer to as exotic vacuum objects. Uh, anyway, um, I will talk a bit more about this in reference to the book by Morabi King and also in reference to uh, the work of Alexander Shishkin. Uh, but anyway, here it is. This is a pattern. You can go ahead and start building devices based off this uh, uh, knowledge here. This is the structure uh, that I uh, <laughs> inferred from uh, looking at the uh, aftermath of various uh, experiments. And, and so essentially what I'm suggesting there is that nature really, really wants to create these structures because we've seen them in a Mars gas, we have seen uh, them in uh, Lion, we have seen them in Echo, we have seen them in a range of different technologies. And so these things like to form and they don't necessarily need this elaborate system here to, to make them. So I'm going to go to the paper because there's some things that are quite relevant in discussions right now. And so the first point here is, for example, when an occasional PMK decayed explosively, we lost valuable equipment until we learned how to muffle the energy of the PMK electromagnetic pulse bursts and also to decrease the incidence of explosive termination. So you have to control them so that they don't blow up and, and shoulders warned uh, that these things can blow up and produce an EMP. And um, you, uh, you, know, <laughs> you can maybe shield for it. And uh, Shishkin goes into the fact that they had learned also how to uh, shield uh, for these things uh, if they should blow up. But I want you to draw attention to something that occurred in Jan uh, February 2016. And uh, that was during our, um, let's find it now. Um, it was during our uh, GS 5.2 experiment. And if you recall, uh, we uh, loaded uh, and we described uh, the process in its entirety. So if I zoom in here, uh, you can see we went up to under the Curie temperature. Uh, this was as uh, described to us by uh, Piantelli. You had to go up as near as you could uh, to the Curie temperature, as comfortable as possible. And then you had to bring the pressure down and then uh, near to the highest D by temperature. And then you had to go pump as fast as you possibly could through the nickel curie. Now, the, the reality is that between 300 and 400 degrees is the temperature range uh, at which you go through the nickel curie. And that's the temperature range at which uh, uh, Ficardi in his 1994, I think, presentation that we previously shared, said that the they observed the absorption of uh, hydrogen into the nickel. I contend that that is not absorption. I contend that that is forming an ultra dense form of hydrogen and that is the temperature for this particular metal uh, at which that would occur. And it's, it's, the, the Curie temperature is, a, is when there's a magnetic state change in the nickel. So you can imagine that atomic hydrogen is formed on the nickel and it's uh, somehow attached to the nickel, let's say, and then it goes through the Curie temperature uh, and it, it does something to organize that matter. Maybe that's what's going on. 
But anyway, um, what was what occurred actually is that if I go here, so this is the temperature where you can see we're going uh, through the Curie temperature as fast as possible, and we change the pressure as described by uh, P and Telly down to half a bar, and uh, as guided by. Um, the work of uh, uh, Parkamov. And then we took it up here into these higher temperature ranges. And guess what? The temperature ranges we are at is, if you look over here, a thousand degrees centigrade. So six was the first time we hit a thousand degrees centigrade. Uh, on, in fact, we're just below, uh, it was between six and seven. And the first time we go over a thousand degrees centigrade is just before seven, and then we're cycling in seven. Now, b between uh, 800 degrees and over a thousand degrees centigrade, remember what Alexander Parkamov has deduced that you need to go over a thousand degrees centigrade before you have the production of cold neutrinos. So here we have the active structures being formed, and here for the very first time we get over a thousand degrees. Uh, and what happened? Well, uh, you may or may not remember it, but what happened was we got this massive pulse. And uh, you can see here down here, we got the killer electron volts going all the way up. Oh, sorry. Uh, going up to uh, one point, mm, all the way up to the the peak here with the potassium here, but these are kind of not, not so interesting, it's just generally raised. Um, but here there's there's an increasing uh, uh, spike all the way up, and it almost asymptotically goes up to zero, but we, we can't see below 30 on this particular scintillator. And anyway, the, the point being is that there is no characteristic, characteristic x-rays that you can see here. It's just a smooth line, and uh, this means, and one nuclear scientist said, oh, this looks like a huge beta burst. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe that's exactly what it was. Certainly that's something that um, uh, 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 shoulders might suggest it is. But here we can see this very strong signal. And also what we see is at this spectrum 7, you can see this huge dead time uh, area. And what this was, was the amount of uh, pulses coming in was so much that it completely saturate, saturated the scintillator, producing a lot of dead time. The other thing that occurred during this time is the power monitor was knocked out. So what it's saying here um, is that, for example, when an occasional uh, plasmac decayed, uh, read exotic vacuum object, decayed explosively, we lost valuable equipment until we learned how to muffle the energy of the electromagnetic pulse burst and also to decrease the incidence of explosive termination. I have said for a number of times that I believed that this event, the signal that we saw in February 2016, was as a result of an EVO blowing up. And I am more convinced than ever. Um, and everything you need to know is we, we, we went through exactly what we needed to do. Uh, going through the, the Curie temperature for nickel, uh, having slowly raised the temperature as fast as we could, and then we raised it up to... Uh, as I said, a thousand, around about a thousand degrees, and this is the temperature at which uh, matter has enough energy to produce cold neutrinos that are in, in the suitable state to interact with the dense hydrogen that we have formed down here. So we have the combination of things going on there, and so that's that, um, and uh, it, it produced let's say, a structure, and um, the structure then did its uh, explosion and, and, and produced the signal. Likewise, uh, when we replicated uh, Lion 2, I just put this footnote in there here right now, we thought it was only going to about 800 and something degrees, but it was later that we found out, post our attempt to, of rec replication, that due to parallax and the, the position of the thermometer that was measuring that 800 and something degrees in the Lion experiments, it was actually in the core over 1,000 degrees. In fact, it was about 1,080. So uh, following the same logic, it was unsurprising that we were unsuccessful in replicating uh, uh, the work of Lion. But I suggest that he was slowly uh, heating. Uh, he went through the 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 um, material was already uh, had atomic hydrogen in there of some type. It then clustered, and then he went up to the suitable temperature to start the process. So um, uh, let's go back to the document. Um, so here's something you need to worry about. So uh, right now, at this moment in time, Rossi is complaining about. 
uh, equipment suggestive that it is uh, electrical equipment that is failing. Uh, this is something that we've been warning about for a very long time uh, and, and it's uh, potentially because you have uh, a exotic vacuum object, a large cluster in fact, of exotic vacuum objects uh, that they term here as everyone likes to give it their own name, a plasmac. Um, and uh, uh, they explode from time to time and uh, you know <laughs> you can't really do a lot about it. Uh, the other thing it says is x-ray emission data and calorimetry and they're saying that Prometheus has measured the presence of x-ray emissions from 20 to 150 kiloelectron volts uh, from a disruptive from a disrupting plasmoid and here we go let's look at our signal so we've got from they're saying from 20 well I would suggest that 20 is uh, probably the uh, the cutoff for their scintillator like our cutoff for our scintillator was at about 30 but it's nearly towards 20 here but uh, you can see we're we're at least going from 20 uh, uh, 30 all the way up to uh, 130 and in fact um, when when the the next uh, trace 8 occurs uh, here and if we go to the whole run trace 8 is here so the trace 8 is just starts here and then we actually raise the temperature and maybe we did something bad at that point. Uh, but anyway, um, at this point, we're still seeing a little bit of something from the average and uh, obviously there's some attenuation below 50 on this particular scintillator. But anyway, the point is that the, this does seem to be some tail here and that's from whatever the detection uh, is starting from, in our case, about 30 to 50 and it's going up to uh, 100 in, in, in this case. So the observations of signal are in line with what is claimed here from research from between 1973 and 2002 for plasmax which are uh, uh, complex uh, plasma formations, uh, um, plasmoids you might like to call them, uh, with a toroidal and poloidal uh, uh, precession uh, uh, fields and so forth. And uh, you know they're seeing the same thing. Now we're just going to pause this here and uh, come back with a sec. So what I wanted to show you was this from the new type of penetrating radiation Alexander Shishkin presentation, which was my translation, which I augmented of the work that was presented by Alexander Shishkin in uh, Sochi in 2018. And uh, I had identified uh, the work of Barkler um, that he had pointed out uh, where they had observed these uh, uh, X-ray emissions, which he called J-radiation, much higher than uh, um, the potential that could come from uh, uh, electrons in K-shell. Uh, and this was actually an interview between Professor Martin Fleischmann and Christopher P. Tinsley in Infinite Energy, I think in 1994 maybe. And he's saying, but we do know that there are high energy X-rays. Gozzi has observed them to over 120 kiloelectron volts. And so Paraparata had also observed that. What are we looking at? Over 120 kiloelectron volts? Well, 150 kiloelectron volts is over 120 kiloelectron volts. And I would argue that these uh, 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 energy um, are, is over 100 uh, and 20, 150 kiloelectron volts also. I think we are seeing the same thing. It's all the same thing. Now, on the next slide, it says P PMKs can be steered uh, into the calorimeter chamber using gas puffing or pulsing them using a magnetic wand. These are able to be moved around uh, by capacitive and mag mag magnetic ways. And also, they suggest another way where you actually puff them because the um, uh, atmosphere is relatively dense in their uh, device they can actually puff them i think in a low pressure environment this would be a, not an option and you would be principally um <clears throat> relying on capacitive and uh, um, uh, magnetic uh, means of shifting the plasmoid into uh, a cradle as it were the sort of thing that the uh, shoulders discussed Visual evidence such as nitrogen fluorescence confirms the presence of low-level energetic electron beams emanating from a localized position, position or positions. These beam electrons are uh, uh, collisionally produced knock-on electrons. These are the kind of electrons that Shoulders said you could uh, pass down a traveling wave tube and you could actually harness electrons by 
um, capturing these uh, high energy electrons that come out. And Shishkin says that they come out, I think, 10, 10 keV, or, or maybe that's, uh, uh, maybe I can look at that for you. Um, I think uh, he says somewhere here. Uh, I will give all the links to the various parts of the presentation um, uh, in the description of the video. So he says, during the explosion of such a soliton, a significant part of the electrons acquire kinetic energy up to 6 to 10 kV. Okay, so <clears throat> in their observations, when one of these things explode, they are um, less uh, energetic than we have observed and the people uh, are doing the plasmax have observed. But anyway, the point is, is that uh, Scholder said that these things shed electrons anyway and uh, that these can be used uh, to generate uh, electricity. Now... One thing I want to draw your attention to is look at the shape of this plasmac, uh, uh, and which they call plasmac. I, uh, I just want to see if you think it bears any any rel uh, relation to this. Here we go. This. Here we go. This. What is this? This is supposedly the ECAT SK. Um, okay, so. Are they the same thing? Oh, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> um, then uh, here we have, uh, as the forming plasmoid becomes hyperconducting, any infiltrating field produced by the continuing current is forced out, producing a sudden reaction force or jerk. Here, the bubble-thin bow shock wave generates a bright flash that obscures the flying plasmoid within. The plasmoid has reached an upward velocity of 50 kilometers per second. This is... Uh, very very high acceleration it's the bright flash that I'm talking about here um, which I'm interested in and I will refer to this um, uh, in the um, work of uh, Shishkin how that might come about but you might have seen brilliant flashes coming out of our experiments with Suhas Ralkar you might have seen them recently periodically uh, in the work of Can who's the uh, doing some similar work to the Woodpecker and uh, uh, um, Parkhamov and Bajatov work with uh, surface discharges. Um, when you get the conditions right, you don't just get a little glowing bit, you get a very large explosion and flash. And, and so I, I'm going to draw your attention to how this may be occurring. So um, then there's maybe just a, a one, one more thing I want to refer to here is... Um, Whilst the, the signal here uh, we had in 2016, there was another time in our history where we had some sort of radiation detection. And we called that gamma, and that was in 2013. And it was following this particular detection um, here that uh, uh, we were contacted by uh, a company uh, called Earth Tech Texas. And uh, it wasn't until um, 2017, I believe, that I worked, uh, found out that actually that that was set up by one Hal Putoff. But it was this particular event that uh, um, uh, got them in contact with us out of the blue. We didn't know who they were, like I say, until 2017, really, um, and offering support. And I think what's interesting is, is that um, this was the uh, hot wire and then the hydrogen uh, being uh, refreshed and I suspect what's going on in that instance is that it's cooling the wire. Uh, there's some more atomic hydrogen being formed. This is clustering. It goes over a threshold temperature and uh, there is some potential deuteron-deuteron uh, uh, fusion from the residual amount of deuterium in there. And that is uh, uh, producing a gamma pulse. Uh, uh, in that event so that actually is fusion and that may have been what what happened uh, when P and Telly uh, observed that and I described that in this uh, sorry Fr Fr Francesco Cellani described that in the initial Rossi demonstration um, it may have been that or it may be uh, any uh, kind of a, a plasmac uh, kind of thing blowing up I'll, I'll talk uh, again on, on this subject with the work of uh, Zatalip and, and Baranoff and, and how uh, they observe similar things and how it relates also to the uh, um, thermocore meltdown and so forth. But anyway, um, so I just wanted to cross-relate this to the thermal neutrons 
here um, that were produced at 250 degrees C in the core in GS 5.3. So in GS 5.3, we were trying to replicate ourselves what happened in GS 5.2 with signal, but this time we were, we were instrumenting with neutron detectors because we saw something really interesting in the uh, spectrometry, uh, um, uh, gamma spectrometry, uh, was uh, the potential for neutrons. Now, look at this. This is 250 degrees C here, and in our gamma, uh, if you actually listen to this video here where we're talking about it, um, uh, there, there is uh, there is a, a temperature which is around about similar. Now I'm saying 150 degrees C. We took the temperatures down, and uh, um, uh, we could actually raise those temperatures higher. And we we have found, and I'll talk also about this uh, in uh, another video. Um, at how there was uh, a very high degree of temperature differential between where it's contacting on the mica and in free air. And so there was a, 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 a gradient there and th there might have been temperatures that were in line with this. So it could have been that in both this case in 2013 and in this case where these thermal neutrons are, are, are produced, it could have been the uh, residual amount of deuterium in there as some uh, uh, ultra dense hydrogen is forming and, and some maybe plasmoids are forming through uh, fractal emission uh, that there is uh, some uh, deuterium, deuterium fusion and resulting in these outcomes. But I am suggesting that all the evidence now with what we know now is suggesting that what we saw in signal is actually pointing to something that uh, Charles Barkler uh, the guy that discovered characteristic X-rays saw in the early part of the 1900s that was observed from 1973 onwards by the authors of the patent, uh, which I referred to earlier here, this patent uh, method and apparatus for generating and using, using, utilizing a compound plasma configuration, which is now free to use and to go ahead and to develop with, which produces these uh, toroidal and poloidal precession based. Uh, um, and if you go and look at my Sochi presentation, you will actually see the diagram that I drew at uh, the beginning of 2000 and was it 18? I think 2017 even maybe. Yeah, to beginning of 2007, certainly 2018, uh, that I drew uh, um, that kind of described it, what 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 it was the only thing that I could uh, draw that would explain what I was observing on all these various experiments, and so this is also the sort of thing that you will see uh, um, in this book by uh, Maury B. King, uh, and it's a force-free toroid. He he calls it. Uh, let me let me just show you that diagram. It's not his diagram. It's from other person's work, uh, and it's you'll 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 recognise the structure. So. Um, here we have a number of people uh, coming from a vast amount of research that are coming up with the same basic structure. I mean, they have a, met a way that they're saying that theirs is being constructed, but uh, others are saying that this is the, the active structure. And um, uh, I will find it here in the middle. Okay, in a minute. So here, here, here is the helical flow uh, in plasmoid vortex ring filament. So you've got the toroidal... Uh, procession here and then you've got the uh, um, poloidal procession here um, and uh, this produces a force-free vortex and that produces natural stability so like I say I will copy the link uh, to a document that goes into the the reason that that makes things stable so anyway I, I think what we have uh, described here in this video is uh, how there is historical precedent, both with what we have uh, um, uh, found in our research and with uh, this document from 2002 referring to work uh, spanning from 1973 onwards, where these type of radiations are emitted, uh, exactly the same as has been observed since the early 1900s by Barclay and by cold re fusion researchers from the late 1980s. Uh, that you get EMP, that we observed, that I think a number of researchers have observed, including shoulders, and that the plasmac does in fact uh, look uh, strikingly like uh, the 
so-called structure in the uh, ECAT. Uh, so I would imagine there's some sort of magnetic or capacitive field confinement here. I, I've described how Shoulders used a penning trap, which is a combination of the two. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I think the problems that are being uh, uh, talked about were highly expected. I've been talking about the fact that these should be expected um, and that uh, the way you build these things um, is quite well described in this document and uh, effectively all you needed to know is uh, actually let's go to the patent because that's online um, so the, the patent is essentially saying have a source of ionization energy and again I will go into why uh, this is more interesting than it first seems according to the work at Dubna over since 2009 by Shishkin et al and this is essentially something similar to <clears throat> what you have in a, a Hutchison setup, but this is actually pre-Hutchison. So, uh, you know, I, I, I believe these things were probably observed by uh, Tesla, and then it was uh, the work was continued by uh, uh, Navy research in the 1950s after the end of the war, um, and I think it really took off in in the. Uh, uh, in the 1970s and then when uh, Hutchison saw his effects I think then um, uh, Shoulders came in and uh, explored uh, the effects that he was seeing and uh, gave a lot more meat on the bone as it were. Anyway all these things are lining up. Um, thank you for your time and I will see you in the next video.